Adam Myers, co-director of the Health and the Public Interest Program at Georgetown University. And I'm pleased to introduce today's um, seminar speaker. This is a regular seminar series, um, usually at this time on Wednesdays. Um, you can get more information on, um, on seminars from the reply that you got when you registered for this one. We're thrilled that we're having um, such great attendance at these seminars while we've been in, on Zoom. One of the rare um, advantages to everyone being locked up and isolated for a while. Um, so the Health and the Public Interest Program is happy today to have um, this seminar by co-director Adrian Fu Berman. Um, She's one of a long list of outstanding seminar speakers that we've had, and you won't regret it if you come back for um, further sessions. I met Adrian, um, I think about 20 years ago, we were um, starting a new graduate program at Georgetown, not this one, but um, a related one. And um, we needed an expert on, um, dietary supplements and herbal medicines. And someone pointed me toward Adrian and it didn't take me long to figure out that Adrian is an expert on a lot of things. And um, that's one of them. She's also um, an expert on um, women's health, um, on medical, she's a medical journalist, all kinds of things. I think these days she's best known for um, being co-director of this program and um, also for her um, expertise. She's really the world's expert on pharmaceutical marketing practices. And um, she has published numerous articles. She'll tell you about her other work in this area today, I'm sure, but she's really making a difference in um, the environment for pharmaceuticals, prescribing, et cetera, and all for the good. And um, those are some of the objectives of our grad program. So if you're um, interested in learning more about um, health and the public interest, look into our program as well. So I'm very happy to introduce my friend and um, collaborator in many things, Adrian Fu Berman. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, I'm, I'm really thrilled to, uh, to be here today and to see so many um, familiar faces and names um, on, on, on the screen here. Um, so my disclosure is that I'm a paid expert witness at the request of plaintiffs in litigation regarding pharmaceutical and medical device uh, marketing practices. And I'm going to start by talking a little bit about uh, pharmaceutical promotion in general, and then more specifically about what Farmed Out has done. So uh, just to make sure that people um, are aware of this, we are not against drugs. Drugs can be a good thing. Some drugs are underused. Drugs can save lives. They can improve health when they're used appropriately. But, they're, but, the, but promotion by industry really interferes with the appropriate use of drugs. It really changes the prescribing habits and uh, beliefs of physicians and other healthcare providers in a way that is not helpful for public health. And one of the problems or the main problem with uh, industry funding and industry interference in a variety of venues is that it limits the discourse uh, in medicine to a few branded drugs. So it tends to be the newest, most expensive drugs. Um, and um, there's limited, uh, limited information and limited discourse about older generic drugs, for example, over-the-counter drugs um, and non-pharmacologic therapies and things like diet and exercise. So physicians often don't know very much about, the, uh, the, about older drugs and about non-pharmacologic therapies. And that certainly has to do uh, with industry influence. And something else that pharmaceutical companies do is essentially invent diseases, um, as something that's been called disease mongering or disease invention. And um, often these diseases are created for specific drugs. Sometimes they're not invented out of whole cloth. They might be pre-existing diseases that um, are, are reframed 
um, or they it might be turning a symptom into a disease. Um, and some sometimes they're just completely made out of whole cloth. Risk factors, personality traits have been turned into diseases. And these quotes are actually from an industry publication that describes condition branding, which is the linking of a specific drug with a specific disease. And uh, they talk about, you can either elevate the importance of an existing condition, something that's already out there, make a symptom into a disease. You can redefine an existing condition to reduce a stigma. And uh, Viagra for erectile dysfunction is a, certainly an example um, of that. Uh, one of the things that the company that created Viagra did was to to change the wording that doctors used from impotence to erectile dysfunction or ED. And then the third way of condition branding is, is developing a new condition or just creating creating one to, to build recognition for an unmet market need. And certainly the Sacklers, um, uh, owners of um, Purdue Pharmaceutical have been in the news um, a lot. And But one of the, the Sacklers you might not hear so much about is Arthur Sackler, who was um, really a, a whiz, really well known in the medical advertising area. And one of the things that he was most known for was working, um, one of his brilliant campaigns was when he was working for Roche, which had an anti-anxiety drug called Librium. And then they created another anti-anxiety drug called Valium. And they didn't want the Valium to cannibalize sales of Librium um, and they, they, they needed to make a distinction between these two in order to sell both. And Arthur Sackler came up with the brilliant idea of um, creating a condition called psychic tension, which was a disease of the modern age that seemed to affect an awful lot of people and was different from generalized anxiety. So that way Librium could be positioned for that's the drug for generalized anxiety, but Valium was the drug for psychic tension to treat the difficulties that um, a student might have going to college for the first time, or uh, a bored housewife might have, or really um, a large variety of people. And Valium was the first um, blockbuster drug. It was the first drug to reach $100 million in sales. So it was, it was uh, really brilliant. And Arthur Sackler uh, really created a number of ways of marketing drugs, including physician education that are still with us today and still compromising public health. There's a long list, this is a partial list of, of conditions that were essentially created by industry. And I'm not going to go over all of these, I will go over a few, but if, if anybody wants to discuss any of these uh, during the q and I'm happy to talk about them, but these are all conditions um, that were essentially created by pharmaceutical companies in order to sell specific drugs. One example is social anxiety disorders. So when Paxil, which is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor came on the market, there were many, it was maybe the sixth uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitor to come on the market. And so it didn't, it would not have been expected to have much market share, but they came up with the brilliant idea of creating market share by um, creating a new disorder and recasting shyness as social anxiety disorder. And that created uh, that created a new market for Paxil. Other diseases that have been invented um, include um, severe underarm sweating. Apparently Botox injections um, can treat this, but the first thing you have to do is to make consumers aware that this isn't just a cosmetic condition, it's a medical condition that can be treated. So this is medicalizing uh, really normal normal variations in, in being human. Binge eating is a troublesome, uh, is, is a symptom that certainly can indicate an underlying, um, an underlying uh, psychiatric uh, problem. Binge, uh, binge eating can be part of, uh, it can go along with anxiety or depression or obsessive compulsive disorder, for example. So certainly as a symptom, it can, it, it, it is something that that should be recognized and um, and assessed, um, and um, and 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 treated as part of an underlying condition. But it it is not a a different specific condition on its own. But binge eating disorder was created in order to to position Vyvanse. So when the um, patent um, protection was running out on um, and this addictive amphetamine 
for um, treating um, ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, um, the company um, created binge eating disorder, sort of a separate uh, disease that could be treated with this addictive amphetamine. And um, we've written an article about this that, that, um, that shows that actually what the, the company was doing was uh, really selling this drug off-label for weight loss. But look at the uh, part of the diagnostic criteria for binge eating disorder. Regularly eating far more food than most people would in a similar time period under similar circumstances. And it has to happen at least once a week for three months. Well, I'm sorry, some of us just have bigger appetites than other people. Um, eating more food at the dinner table than somebody else at the dinner table does not mean that you have a brain disease. Um, otherwise, this is certainly a disease that, that I suffer from. And I would say it's definitely more than once a week, try three times a day. Pseudovulvar affect or, or PVA is taking a real condition. There are people with, uh, with, with certain kinds of brain diseases or brain injuries that will have very inappropriate laughing or crying. So this is, this is uh, something that has been known for many years. But um, a, the, a company that, that created a drug for pseudovulvar affect, it's a very, very small market. It would be some people who had been affected by stroke or affected by injury. So they wanted to expand the market. So that's a very typical, typical tactic uh, for, for drug companies. And um, so in order to expand the market, they had to convince more people that they actually had, had PBA. And so here's a test that was on the internet. Um, and uh, we, we administered this test to um, anybody who walked into the farmed out office over a period of several days. Um, most of the women actually failed um, this test. <laughs> um, but but look at these criteria. I seem to become amused very easily. I'm, I'm suddenly overcome by funny or happy thoughts. Uh, I find myself crying easily. Um, these are not necessarily symptoms of of a disease. I find that I'm easily overcome by laughter. This might apply to many teenagers. The drug that was created to uh, treat this expanded market for PBA was Nuodexta. And it was a combination of two old drugs, um, dextromethorphan, a cough suppressant available over the counter, which on its own would cause eight, cost 18 cents a pill. Um, and quinidine, uh, which is, uh, which is an uh, old generic drug, um, also very inexpensive, but the combination of these two costs $16 a pill. And that is really the purpose of disease branding, um, uh, uh, condition branding, is to sell drugs, often drugs that aren't even actually new, but might just be a tweak on an old drug, a combination of uh, generic drugs, a combination of a generic drug and an over-the-counter uh, drugs, something like that. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about pre-launch uh, marketing and the use of key opinion leaders and, um, and third party or um, organizations. So marketing a drug actually starts, can start seven to 10 years before a drug comes on the market. Now it's actually illegal to, to promote a drug before it's on the market, but it's not illegal to promote the disease. And that is what drug companies do through a variety of means, they promote the disease, or they also uh, might do campaigns um, that um, point out all of the adverse effects of drugs that are currently on the market for a condition, for example. Um, or, um, but, uh, but a lot of the marketing is, might be exaggerating the importance or severity of a disease that they want to treat. So this pre-launch marketing is very, very important for condition branding. And it, what and an, an important way of doing that is by using third parties. So as I said, it's illegal for a pharmaceutical company to promote a drug before it's on the market. So you have to use professional organizations. You have to use consumer advocacy organizations. And opinion leaders are very important. Um, not And this used to be physicians, um, then expanded into um, uh, nurse, nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, but now it's expanded into consumers, consumer influencers, people who have a, a following on Facebook or Instagram um, are, may be hired by pharmaceutical companies um, in, order, uh, in order to influence their peers. 
And who, who do these parties influence? Everybody, um, certainly healthcare providers are used to influence other healthcare providers. Um, patients are used to influence patients. And, but both of these groups of influencers are used to influence legislators, regulators, policymakers, payers, um, anybody who can help a, a company maintain market share for specific targeted drugs. So pharmaceutical companies and pharmaceutical company vendors keep track of who is who are influencers and they keep track at a local level, a regional level and a national level. So nationally known um, opinion leaders are called KOLs or key opinion leaders, often academics, um, often physicians, although um, they, they may be other professions as well. But this is, this is an industry um, graphic sort of showing all of the links. You know, these are all of the people that the KOL can, can affect. They can, they can affect the regional opinion leader, a local thought leader. So even if, um, even if you are a, a rural physician, there would still be a physician in the area that perhaps everyone turns to because they are uh, the most uh, experienced physician, for example. So that would be a local thought leader. A regional might be somebody who's known in the state a KOL would be somebody who's known nationally, and they could be somebody who could influence formulary committees and uh, influence nurse practitioners and influence all these other people. So this is a very important concept in selling drugs. Now, KOLs never sell the drug directly. It is the drug rep's uh, role to sell the drug. It is the opinion leader's role to sell the disease. They're very important for creating a awareness of invented conditions. So pediatric bipolar disorder, for example, uh, which really um, we, I, I was taught in medical school that bipolar disorder didn't manifest until people were in their 20s. Um, drug companies changed that um, and um, created this category of pediatric bipolar disorder um, that resulted in our giving uh, mixtures of potent antipsychotics to children as young as eight months old. Um, some of them died. Um, so pediatric bipolar disorder really but, but they needed key opinion leaders to go out and tell people um, pediatric bipolar disorder. It's not just the terrible twos. This is a mental health disorder and these children need treatment. So increasing awareness of um, invented conditions is important. Expanding diagnostic categories um, that the, the categories at which I, I was taught in medical school constituted um, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, even diabetes. All of those numbers have gone down and down over time. And of course, there are uh, the, the lower the number is for diagnosing hypercholesterolemia or diabetes, the more patients you have. And this is also an important concept that there are more healthy people than there are sick people. And if pharmaceutical companies can make healthy people feel sick, they've got a lot more customers. KOLs, KOLs are also important for promoting off-label, unproven uses of drugs. Uh, uses of drugs that it would be illegal for a drug company to promote, the KOL can promote. And they're important for uh, making physicians and other prescribers feel better about adverse effects. If your drug, you made a drug that has recently been linked to liver failure, you need your KOLs to go out there and say, well, it's not really clear. Our drug is, um, is this drug is linked to, to liver failure or many drugs that treat this disease are linked to liver failure or uh, liver failure. It's not the worst thing. So you need KOLs to mitigate those perceptions of adverse effects. And you also need them for undermining competing therapies. And KOLs are used to undermine not only uh, competing drug therapies, but even competing non-pharmacologic therapies um, that they, they e even will dis diet and exercise. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Farmed Out. Um, this, is, this is some of our team, um, some of our interns and, and, and staff, and we're a Georgetown University Medical Center project, um, and we promote evidence-based prescribing, and we educate healthcare professionals about pharmaceutical and also medical device marketing practices, and we also provide access to unbiased information um, about therapeutics. And I, I'm going to talk just a little bit about our history because <laughs> we were just figuring out today that we've actually been around for 15 years. I can't believe it's been that long. But we were originally funded um, through the Attorney General Prescriber and Consumer Grant Program, which was a, a, a never before program in which all 50, well, all 50 states in Washington, DC had sued Warner Lambert, a subsidiary of Pfizer, 
uh, for off-label illegal promotion of Neurontin. And uh, that they that created a fund and the attorneys general used it to fund um, uh, many, uh, many groups to educate um, physicians and other prescribers about pharmaceutical company influence. And we, we got one of those grants. So we had a meeting in August 2006 in the French embassy cafeteria, which we had access to at that time it was a really great place to have lunch. Uh, and we were, uh, we several several of us were sitting around uh, trying to come up with a name for our um, our project. And um, Jay Seawick came up with a fabulous name, um, Farmed Out. Um, so we adopted that. And a few days, uh, a little a little while later, Shahar Mahari, um, a former uh, drug rep, um, got in touch with us, and we had we part of our our original team um, was. Jim Ridgway, um, who made videos um, for us. And um, we, we, we decided to film an interview uh, with Shahra Mahari. Days later, a story broke in the New York Times um, about uh, Zyprexa, which is the, the, the antipsychotic drug that Shahra Mahari um, represented. And uh, David Eagleman, um, I think also, I believe both David and Shaharam are on this call. Uh, David Eagleman um, had, had himself subpoenaed uh, and gave um, confidential legal documents to a New York Times reporter. So there was this wonderful, amazing story about the promotion of Zyprexa in the, in the New York Times. And, um, and Jim Ridgway um, told, who's an investigator, he, an investigative reporter, a longtime investigative reporter. So Jim, um, J Jim is perhaps best known for having exposed um, GM's black ops operations against uh, Ralph Nader uh, when Ralph Nader was exposing um, um, accidents caused by shoddily made um, uh, GM cars. Um, but Jim also um, had wrote many books and exposed so much corruption in universities, in neo-Nazi groups, in, um, 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 in sex work among politicians. Um, Jim was the most amazing investigative reporter. Uh, um, and um, he called me up to say, we have to release the video that we made of Shahram. And I, I, I said, we, we can't, we, we don't exist yet. We don't have a phone number. We don't have a website. We can't release this. And he, he insisted that we release this. So we did a flash edit on it and sent it out on, on YouTube. And uh, it hit the national, it hit national news um, because it was, um, it, it was, you know, just immediately after the story that was in the New York Times. And um, it, lawyers were calling us up, um, asking us, you know, if they could use the video. I'm telling people on the phone, well, I don't know how to download it from YouTube. If you can get some young person to figure it out, great, <laughs> more power to you. So when we first hit the scene, we were sort of this mysterious, um, this, this mysterious group, and uh, we were all already um, already influential. Um, Shahram um, and I wrote an, an article following the script, How Drug Reps Make Friends and Influence Doctors, that has been downloaded hundreds of thousands of times, which for a medical journal article is almost uh, unheard of, um, but do documenting the tactics that, that drug reps use to influence physicians. Um, Jim Ridgway made uh, many, many videos for us. I'm really sorry to say that Jim died last, um, just last Saturday, uh, it's really a great loss for us, but really a great loss um, for the world. He was um, a wonderful man and um, an in incredible muckraking journalist. So promotion includes many different things, drug rep visits to healthcare providers, meals, gifts, free samples, meetings and events, publications, and um, Third party strategies and farmed out has really led the way in addressing all of these categories. Pharmaceutical companies don't give out pens anymore, but they uh, they used to give out a lot of pens. And um, these these ads are from industry publications. So this is from a pen manufacturer, uh, another ad from a, a company that makes um, patient uh, models and uh, models. 
meals and uh, patient models and um, things that are used for patient care are still allowed to be given out by pharmaceutical companies. They give out many gifts and uh, many meals. Um, so, um, there are many ways in which pharmaceutical companies use social psychology, social psychologic techniques to manipulate the habits of um, physicians. And these are used by both drug reps and KOLs. Every culture has a, um, has a, a tradition of reciprocation. If someone gives you something, you owe them something back. Physicians pay back through their prescriptions. Uh, we are a Physicians like to be in the middle of the pack. They like to um, do what their peers are doing. So social proof or peer influence is very important. Uh, once we start prescribing a drug, uh, we believe in it more and more. So that that uh, that shows commitment and consistency. I'm not going to through, go through all of these, but for anybody who's interested, uh, Sunita saw um, and, um, and I uh, wrote an article showing how different social psychology techniques can be used to manipulate um, physicians. Some of the things that Farmed Out has done in, in this area is we've written uh, many articles having to do with drug reps and other people in industry influencing physicians. Um, these are some clips from a couple of the, a couple of the interviews um, that, we, that we did with, uh, with Shahram and um, with Doug Melnick and with other industry. We have a number of videos with industry insiders. We also collected drug rep items, and we've actually created a photographic library of those called um, PharmaBait. Um, and that is, uh, any, anyway, if anybody wants to wants pictures of promotional items of various, um, representing various drugs, they can come to our website and just download those for use in, in presentations, et cetera. These are just a few of the many drug rep items that we've collected over the years. We also created, um, be, because pharmaceutical companies so often buy lunch for physicians, um, we distributed um, lunch boxes so that medical students and residents could bring their own lunch to industry funded events that they might be required to go to. Uh, many of them are required to go to industry uh, funded events. And um, um, one of our team members, uh, Judy Davis, came up with the wonderful BYOL for bring your own lunch. That was one of our, our mantras. And um, Tom Sherman at Georgetown um, created recipes for our BYOL um, sandwich guide, which is available on our website. And then we also have a downloadable no drug reps pledge <laughs> that physicians can put up in their offices to explain to patients why they're not taking um, why they, they might not be distributing samples and why there aren't drug reps in the office. Um, it, we, we did a lot in this area. And at this point, about one out of four doctors do not see drug reps. And I think that really is partially due to all of our um, efforts over the last um, 15 years. And one of the areas that Farmed Out um, does a lot of work in is continuing medical education, which is required for almost all physicians in the United States. And there's a, a lot of pharmaceutical company influence on CME, and it's not regulated as promotion. The FDA considers CME education, so it is not regulated, and it is a very important marketing tool for uh, pharmaceutical companies. And we're, we're, I think we're the only group in the world that's working on industry influence on CME. All industry-funded CME conveys marketing messages, but they may not be obvious, as we were talking about with KOLs. Um, they're not selling the drug specifically, they are selling a message. And the message might be this other drug is bad or diet and exercise is bad, or uh, there's, um, uh, you know, we're missing a treatment for this particular uh, tragically underdiagnosed condition. One of the ways that, that pharmaceutical companies also um, have influences by giving so-called unrestricted grants to universities or medical centers for grand rounds, for example, or for journal clubs for their residents or students. These unrestricted grants are only unrestricted until you invite someone like me to give a grand rounds. Um, and, um, and often this influence is quite subtle. They'll, they'll, allow, um, they'll allow the organizer to invite a number of people as long as it's not someone like me, but they can invite their own people. But after a year or so, um, the, the person funding, the, the person from the drug company might give a list of 
suggested speakers to the organizer. And the, the organizer will look at the list and they'll think, oh, I've seen some of these people at national meetings. It doesn't look like you're compromising anything to choose someone off that list. And that's all pharma wants. They just want to seed a few of their speakers into the speaker program. Um, and um, if the, uh, some of the other spe speakers, some of the other programs are unconflicted, the audience won't notice if you, you slip in a few that have, have particular messages. One of the things that Farmed Out did under the uh, Attorney General grant is we created a, a slideshow um, for, we, we created a presentation um, for physicians and then we called up, um, uh, we called up academic medical centers and said, uh, hey, but, you know, we, we're this new project farmed out. Uh, we'd like to come give a presentation to your physicians and we can pay for lunch. And invariably, uh, the person on the other end would say, okay, that's great. I'll put you on the schedule. And I'm sorry, what pharmaceutical company did you say you represented? So Alicia Bell, whose name is on this publication, was our first project manager, and she got really sick of people saying this to her on the phone. She would explain over and over again, we weren't from a pharmaceutical company, but we were paying for lunch because that is apparently how you can get into, um, into medical centers is by paying for lunch. So we went in and we did our farmed out, um, our farmed out presentation called Why Lunch Matters. And um, afterward, you know, people have to fill out a, an evaluation and people were scrawling things on their evaluations that were these affirmations that were very odd, odd to us and very, very nice. <laughs> but people were essentially, after seeing our presentation, they were saying, I'm never seeing a drug rep again. I'm not going to any of these dinners. No more, more, no more reps, I'm done, no more free lunches. So we actually ended up writing that article, even though we weren't really doing a study, we ended up publishing an article on the success of, of, um, of, this, of, of this presentation. But since we've been unable to pay for lunch, we, we don't get very many invitations. And it makes sense if pharmaceutical companies are funding these these meetings and these these meeting series, um, e you are going to, uh, you know, your funding is going to go away if you invite um, someone like me. I am available for Grand Rounds talks. So we've written a lot uh, more than anyone on the influence of pharmaceutical companies on CME, including we've developed methods for reverse engineering marketing messages from continuing, continuing medical education. So we've done that with binge eating disorder, hypoactive sexual desire disorder, um, and um, also uh, on um, the marketing of Actique and Fentoro, which are uh, fentanyl products. Um, and we've, we've written a lot of articles um, on this. So uh, we've got quite, quite, quite a collection on them. We also created um, web-based continuing medical education. These are some of the earlier, the earlier pharma-free uh, educational modules that we did. And then we also were very um, pleased to be the founding members along with Dr. Susan Wood at, uh, the, at George Washington uh, Millikan Institute School of Public Health and Washington DC Department of Health, we created the DC Center for Rational Prescribing, um, which was, I, I think the first um, jurisdictionally based pr provider of um, a pharma-free continuing education for physicians. And we persuaded DC to make them available, make those are the modules that we created, the 16 modules available to anybody in the US and more than 6,000 doctors PAs, uh, nurses, and pharmacists took our, our module. So we, we made this program into a nationally known um, model um, for pharma-free education. Um, um, like I said, more than 6,000 people took our modules. Um, this project is now being, being run by, by someone else, but we were very pleased to, uh, to make it a successful um, program in its first five years. So I've talked a little bit about um, third-party strategy, and we've written about how about consumer groups um, and how they are used to carry pharma's water, um, and even how patients themselves are are targeted. That patients with expensive diseases, like hemophilia, for example, and this is actually true of other diseases as well, are individually targeted um, by pharma. That people with hemophilia actually have drug reps um, assigned to them almost um, from uh, birth. Uh, Anyway, that 
you're interested in that, uh, you can read our article on on, um, on hemophilia. Um, we've also been the 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 first group to um, publish articles on how pharm pharmaceutical companies influence some pharmacists um, and how medical device representatives uh, influence surgeons. Um, so there's the list of our articles um, on our website. So word about advertising and uh, and medical um, journals. Most medical journals rely on pharmaceutical advertising and also pharmaceutical companies purchasing subscriptions and reprint um, and and reprints of articles that they like. Um, so this is an advertisement from Annals of Internal Medicine to pharmaceutical companies saying, you know, advertise with us. Um, this is the New England Journal of Medicine, um, also advertising to pharmaceutical companies. Location is everything, no matter what you're selling. Advertising, of course, is directed at consumers um, as well. And I had mentioned that one way of, of promoting a drug is by, uh, is, is by saying bad things about com competing drugs. Um, and uh, Lipitor had a whole series of advertisements directed at consumers. Essentially, these are anti-diet and exercise ads. <laughs> you may think exercise and healthy diet will lower your cholesterol, which of course it will. <laughs> but these are ads that are, are meant to make people feel like that it's useless to do diet and exercise for lowering cholesterol. And you should just go straight to the drugs. Don't kid yourself. Um, so we, we, we've written an article questioning why um, the almost entirely advertising in medical journals is, is uh, pharmaceutical ads. Um, that really affects, by the way, what articles um, they will accept, what, uh, you know, what news they will run. Um, we created drug ads exercises that can, can be used for medical students or uh, residents or attending physicians. They're, they're available um, on our our website um, as well. Um, we, we decided, it seems like a lot of docs are not very familiar with statistics. So we did a, a, a very fast review that's available on our website of absolute risk, relative risk and number needed to treat, which is a really important um, concept when evaluating drugs in coalition with the National Women's Health Network, one of the few consumer advocacy groups that doesn't take any money from pharmaceutical companies. Uh, we created fact sheets um, for consumers as well. And we've been in the media um, a, a fair uh, amount in, in um, documentaries. Um, uh, the Bleeding Edge uh, looked at medical uh, devices, which is another area that we that we we work in as well. Um, so a few of our, our publications about ghost writing and ghost management um, and control of um, perspectives in industry uh, literature are on this slide. And we've really done quite a lot on our really, I think the, the organizing principle is we're interested in covert marketing. We're interested in marketing that doesn't look like marketing. How does industry influence what physicians and other prescribers think and pharmacists think about diseases and think about uh, drugs? We are now, uh, we're, we're working on a lot of different things. We're still working on CME. We're still working on disease awareness campaigns and disease invention, but we're doing a lot on opioids. And oh, we're particularly moving into um, the international opioids um, arena that prescription opioids are the reason that we have an opioid um, overuse disorder and, um, and overdose death epidemic in the US. Um, and unfortunately, opioid promotion is being exported to other countries. And, uh, and we're, we're looking into that with our, our fabulous um, interns. Um, Judy Butler is our fabulous uh, research fellow. And um, she, she has written a lot about um, uh, opioids, including um, um, including many articles in our, our, our Farmed Out uh, newsletter. This is Ben Goodwin, um, a former Farmed Out uh, intern and now medical student um, at, at Georgetown, um, testifying before Health and Human Services um, Committee. Uh, we did a, a petition supporting the, the very rational CDC guidelines on um, opioids. This is former project manager uh, Sophie Krensky um, testifying before uh, DC City Council. So we, we do a lot of testifying 
This is only a partial list of all of the articles that Judy Butler, our research fellow, has written in Farmed Out um, uh, newsletter. I think most organization newsletters don't break news, but we have broken news in some of these um, stories. It's an incredible uh, resource for anyone interested in opioids and um, that please sign up for our Farmed Out newsletter, which comes out uh, once a month and always has a column um, by Judy in it. We had a whole conference on opioids in 2019. We have another conference that will that um, is planned for June 16th, 18th. Um, so please, please plan to come to that. It will be um, it will be all virtual, so easy to attend. Um, this is this is uh, part of our crew from uh, a, a year or uh, two ago uh, at an event. That's um, Alicia Hogan Miller in the front and the left, uh, also former project manager um, for Farmed Out and. Uh, uh, a lot, a lot of other people from our our, our crew, um, and these these are some not a complete list, but uh, some of our our, our current um, farmed out interns working on international opioids and and many other uh, many other issues. We have a really great great team this year. Um, because of COVID, uh, <laughs> we don't have everyone in the same office anymore. This is our um, socially distanced uh, workplace uh, with Caroline Ranko on the left, our former, our, our current project manager, um, and V Yuen on the, uh, on the uh, right, who uh, is the educational coordinator for the Health and the Public Interest Master's Program and also um, hel helps us with Farmed Out. And that's Ekaterina in front. Uh, but please plan to join us for our 2021 conference. It'll be June 16th, 18th um, for half days um, on each of three days. So easy to attend. Um, and to sign up for our newsletter, um, we'll also have announcements, of course, on, on our website um, about uh, um, the updating you know, agenda, et cetera, on the conference. Um, so thank you very much. Um, Please keep in touch with us. We're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, we have a website, <laughs> we have a newsletter. And I'm going to end there and uh, we're, we'll, we will um, open it up for um, questions um, or um, comments, which can be either put in the, the chat, but um, we'll, we will um, also unmute you. So if you want to um, just ask a question um, orally, that is, um, that, that's totally fine too. So as a moderator, well, first of all, thank you, Adrian, for a great um, seminar. And I'm sorry that I really didn't do an adequate introduction, but you know, usually I go on forever about uh, all the great stuff you've done and great adventures we've had. Um, if I didn't mention it, Adrian is professor of pharmacology and physiology at Georgetown University Medical Center. She has an MD from Georgetown, a um, post-baccalaureate um, experience at UDC and um, an undergraduate degree from American University. And um, she is a full-time faculty of Georgetown University. I'd like to open up the questions first to any of um, the students in our class. So if, if you have questions, you can, um, I'm gonna ask that V unmute the students or at least give them the ability to unmute. Um, so if you want to jump in with questions, we'll go with them first and um, we'll, we'll be looking at the, um, at the chat box and people may get a chance to directly address their questions. But I have to say that there's great people in this audience